All right, guys, we are deep in the middle of a shootout between this baby 4.8 LS and the massive 8.1 liter Gen 7 big block that's in the ugly truck. Today, we're going to be tearing the LS down to see what kind of condition the internals are in, and then we'll clean everything up and gap the rings to prepare this short block to hold a ton of boost. And just maybe it'll make more power and torque than the turbo big block. Uh, about a year ago, I had a video that I produced after I just finished up the naturally aspirated 8.1 swap in the ugly truck. And I was pretty happy with the results. It put down 308 horsepower and 427 pounds of torque at the rear tire. And it was a blast to drive. I loved that truck. And since then, we've turboed that one. Uh, but a lot of you guys commented in that video that I would have been better off to spend the $3,010 that it cost me to do that 8.1 swap. In, I would have been better off to invest that in the LS that I replaced the 8 point, or that was replaced by the 8.1. That's what I'm trying to say. And that idea just kind of stuck with me. Well, would I have been better off? And that question depends on a million different factors. Like if I would have put that money into a turbo kit, yeah, I could have made a lot more money. But I kind of wanted something unique, and I've always been a big block guy. Like my very first truck, I swapped in a 472 Cadillac V8. So I just, I love big blocks. But anyway, the whole small versus large engine idea just kind of stuck with me, and that's what we're doing. We're, um, we're spending the same budget, $3,010, which I probably should adjust for inflation <laughs> since that year ago. But anyway, um, I did a baseline dyno on the 4.8, and it's like 100 horsepower and 200 pounds of torque, less than the big block. So. We got a lot of ground to make up and I'm not necessarily convinced that we're actually going to be able to get there. A lot of you guys want me to swap to a larger, you know, a 5.3 or a 6.0 or even like a 6.2, but in the spirit of competition, if I'm going to be swapping an engine, I'm going to go a lot bigger than a 6.2. I mean, I might do like a 408 stroker, that's like 6.6 .6 liters, or who knows? So I want to stick with the LS that came with this truck, which is a 4.8. That's what we have, but also, I think it's a really cool idea just kind of comparing the smallest versus the largest V8 that they made in Silverados of this era. So that's what we're doing. We're sticking with the 4.8. And uh, in terms of budget, a lot of you guys have uh, given me your opinion on the budget, how I should spend it. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. I have a feeling the budget is kind of blown already, um, but we'll kind of run some numbers a little bit later and get to that. But first, we need to get this engine torn down. Um, since you guys have seen this last, I've got it up on the engine stand. I cleaned up, uh, last time I cleaned everything up with a pressure washer because this was just nasty. Uh, we got the manifolds off and like these trucks do, there is one bolt in each side that is broken off. That's not a huge deal. We'll weld a nut on there and back those guys out. Um, but from here, basically what I got to do, uh, we'll pull the valve covers, pull the intake. We are going to pull the heads off. I did get some head gaskets. I decided just to go ahead and gap the rings on this thing because eventually, just like the ugly truck with the turbo big blog, this engine is going to get turbocharged as well. And we'll do sort of a similar budget comparison uh, once I get the engine in, but um, we do have a much healthier budget for that because it cost me about 5,000 bucks to turbo the 8.1. So um, I'll probably actually be able to make more power. Uh, I'll put it this way. I'll definitely be able to make more power for less money by turbocharging the 8.1. Sorry, 4.8. Then I did the 8.1, but mainly because I was so conservative with the tune-up on the 8.1 because of its fragile pistons. Anyway, that's a whole other conversation for another time. And the 8.1 is getting built up with a 547 stroker, which maybe someday in the same sort of progression, this 4.8 will get replaced with something much bigger and much stronger. Anyway, that's like way down the road. We've got a lot more stuff to do with the truck before then. So let's get started by tearing this down. So everything that we're doing here is just pretty basic mechanic work, you know, tearing an engine down, taking it apart. You don't really need any special tools and we're just kind of getting this thing down to the bare block. Once the valve covers are off, I'm working on the intake manifold. And you might notice here a few times, I'm actually taking things off in like the reverse torque sequence as they go together. On uh, something like a plastic intake manifold is probably not quite so critical, but when we move on to the cylinder heads, for example, I always try to remove the bolts by hand in the reverse order as you put them on. 
Um, now the same kind of thing applies to the valve train here. You can see I'm turning the engine over so both the intake and exhaust rocker on a single cylinder are on the base circle of the cam so there's no extra spring pressure on the bolt. That just kind of makes life easier when you're taking things apart. And here you can see the outer row of the head bolts and the, now the major head bolts. We're taking them off in the reverse order by hand. It's also worth mentioning here that the head bolts on this particular LS, um, they're a short and long version, um, and also they're torque to yield, so you cannot reuse the head bolts over. I'm going to be replacing the head bolts with some ARP bolts just because they're stronger and they'll help clamp the head down a little bit better than stock. Also, we're going to be replacing the factory composite head gasket with a Mala MLS gasket gasket, excuse me, designed specifically for the 99 and 2000, 4.8 and 5.3. You will need some sort of a special puller to get the balancer off because if you just use a three jaw puller, you can damage the outside rib of it. And then once the timing cover's out of the way, just a couple of quick bolts to get the upper sprocket off. And if you're doing a cam swap in a vehicle and if you're not messing with the oil pump, I'll even leave the oil pan on and just kind of let the chain dangle down like you see there and pull the cam out and put the new one in. But because we're doing a complete teardown, we are going to keep moving on and remove the oil pickup tube as well as the oil pump. So it's the next day, it's just about noon time, and I'm now realizing that I might have actually done this job for nothing. Uh, I'll explain that in just a second, but I have signed myself up for a ton of work, and that work is just cleanup because taking the engine apart, I think within like two, two and a half hours, I got the entire thing pretty much stripped down. Um, but the cleanup work, I just worked on one rod and piston assembly. It took me probably 45 minutes just for that one. I'm glad I'm doing it. I think it really needed it because the rings were, not frozen in there, but the oil ring especially was like really, really gummed up, and I don't think it was sprung out all the way against the, uh, the cylinder wall. This is what piston number three looks like, and kind of like I mentioned there, that bottom oil ring is just filled with this crusty sludge. It's not like oily and slimy, it won't just wipe off. That is just like a really hard, crusted on dirt. The tops of the piston, same thing, those will clean up really easy. Um, but anyway, this is what it started out as, and after about 45 minutes or so, it looks like this over here. And this is kind of how I'm gonna lay everything out to stay organized. I've got all the, I've got the odd side here, the even side will kind of go there. Um, just cleaning by hand, this is what everything looks like afterwards. It looks way better. And the worst part is just getting the dirt out of those grooves. And as you can see, I didn't get it all, um, but about 45 minutes worth of work, I got most of it. And the next worst part was actually cleaning up this oil ring right here because all that crusty sludge gets in between each and one, every one of those little like wavy things. And these are like super thin and flimsy, so it'd be easy to damage it. But um, I cleaned that all up. That took probably 15, 20 minutes just for each, for that one. Um, and that's the rest of the stuff there. In terms of getting the dirt out of the grooves, uh, I'm not gonna tell you to do this, I'm just telling you what I did, but I've got a half worn out Sawzall blade, and this is actually just about the right thickness to get in that the top two grooves and kind of help pull out some of that sludge. Um, I also made sure that the kerf, I measured it with a pair of calipers, the kerf on it, because it's a worn Sawzall blade, um, it's not actually wider than the groove that the ring goes in. So be careful of that because I did check a fresh blade and that would actually make the, the, uh, the ring land a little bit wider. So don't do that, but uh, I just found it was, a, for me, a pretty good size to help clean out some of that caked on sludge that's in the upper two ring lands. So um, what am I talking about doing this whole job for nothing? Well. A lot of people speculate that a higher mile engine, the ring gap will actually be opened up by itself just because of natural wear and tear. Uh, this is a 180,000 mile 4.8, and the oil changes apparently haven't been done when they probably should have been. But the ring gap, I measured the top two, they're 30 thousandths of an inch. Now, whenever you say build a motor and you calculate the ring gap for a forced induction application with this size bore, I think it's like 3780 is the 4.8 bore, that works out to be like a 24 to a 26 thousandths of an inch ring gap, uh, but both of mine are at 30. Now, 
You might think, well, that could lead to excessive blow-by. I didn't really notice anything. I didn't see any smoke coming out of the tailpipe. The thing seemed to run really, really good for the, I put 600 miles on the truck since I bought it. Um, the dyno guy had claimed that it was misfiring on the dyno. I, it's never misfired for me, so I don't know what that was about. But um, yeah, it's got plenty of ring gap in it already, so I probably could have left the bottom end together. But I'm glad I did not because of how dirty and nasty and caked up those rings were and pretty much the whole block was nasty. So I'm glad I'm taking the time to clean it up, but it's probably gonna take me an entire day of cleaning just to get this short block put back together. And then that's not even counting the top end because we've got both cylinder heads to clean up um, before I swap the valve springs over, you know, the oil pan, the front and rear cover, the uh, windage tray, and then the valley cover. All this stuff is gonna to have to be cleaned up, but I wanna get the internal parts done first, you know, all the, the eight pistons and rods, because once I start putting this nasty stuff in the parts washer, it'll make a huge mess in there. So anyway, uh, I got some work to do guys. I'll catch up with you in just a little bit. Now cleaning up is never a fun job, but it's something that's very important to do if you're gonna be assembling engines, especially if you're doing more of a rebuild situation where you're using old parts over again. And I think one of the biggest challenges here on the pistons was just cleaning out all the carbon and crud from the grooves on the ring. And I tried a couple of different methods and I think the one that I found that worked the best for me was just using a worn out Sawzall blade and the teeth were just wide enough to kind of get in the ring groove to help clean out some of the carbon, but I used a variety of things, you know, red scotch bright pads, the parts cleaning brush, and then just a flat putty knife scraper thing that kind of together allowed me to get most of the crud off of these pistons. I spent probably the longest time just working on the little oil ring here. You can kind of see I'm using just a thin hacksaw blade and just very gently sawing back and forth to kind of scrape out all that crud that's between each and every one of those little ridges. So over at the block, I'm just using some 220 grit sandpaper and a hard aluminum sanding block, along with a little bit of WD-40 just to clean up the deck surface. I do not like using the red scotch bright pads on the little, you know, the little whizzy wheel because that makes the deck surface a little bit uneven, where a hard aluminum sanding block just kind of keeps everything nice and flat. It might not look quite as clean, but if you want a truly flat surface, this is the way to, to go, other than, I guess, sending it to an actual machine shop. I also like to use a crosshatch pattern just because that makes sure all the scratches don't go in the same direction. It's kind of like honing a cylinder, just you want a little bit of back and forth pattern, so I went uh, two different diagonal directions as well as straight back and forth. Next up, we'll just be pulling the pistons out of the block. Very simple, just take the two rod bolts out and gently tap the piston up until you can grab it and pull it out of the bore. And here you can really, really see how kind of nasty and carboned up the original pistons were. So to pull the rings off of the piston, you can use a specialty ring compressor slash installer, but I find it's easiest just to kind of pull the rings out a little bit until you can kind of pivot them around. And that way they easily just kind of walk right off and that way you don't have to spread them out too far. You can see there's a ton of crud on the upper and lower oil rail and we need to get all that out of there. All right, so once the block is 100% empty, I'm just taking some brake cleaner and trying to rinse everything out. Uh, the crankshaft still is in the block, so I'm trying not to scrape and move a ton of debris down in there, but just a good blast of brake clean will help it out. And then we've got this aluminum oil barbell seal that goes into the rear oil gallery that just will hold up a little better than the stock plastic one. And then because I have the block hanging up in the air, now is a great time to install the rear cover along with a brand new seal. 
All right, guys, this represents probably six hours worth of work, just getting all the pistons and rings cleaned up. And everything looks way, way better than it did before. Um, the little uh, oil rings right here, these took a lot of time just because they're so delicate and there's like 80,000 little grooves in there that I had to clean out one at a time. But this is, uh, well, seven out of the eight, the other one's on the workbench. Take your time, make sure everything stays organized, that each ring stays in the bore that it came out of. You know, your bearing caps, you wanna make sure they stay with the rod that they were attached to and so on. And even the bearings, like make sure your upper bearing is in the upper spot and the lower goes back to where it came from because I am gonna be reusing all of that. In terms of orientation, the second ring, you can tell which one that is because it has a little dot on it, if we can focus right there. Uh, the dot goes up and that's the second ring. The top ring, there is no dot, there is no marking on it. And in theory, you could put this right side up or upside down because the shape is symmetrical. But just if you can remember, try to put it back in the way that it came out facing the same way. Uh, oil rings, you don't have to gap these. You don't have to worry about up, down or sideways. Just make sure that they go in in the right, you know, in the right sequence. Uh, so yeah, that's basically my whole day yesterday was cleaning everything up. And the ring gap, I think, like I mentioned before, measured in for two of them right at 30 thousandths of an inch for both the upper and the lower ring. Uh, if we were starting with a fresh build, we'd probably try to set those in the mid 20s, like 24 to 26, with the second one maybe a little bit wider. But because just with 180,000 miles on it, they're already opened up beyond that. Uh, I will check everyone when I put it back together to make sure that they're, I'm gonna try to get them all at least in the same ballpark, but um, chances are they're all gonna be pretty darn close to each other. So uh, just the whole theory behind gapping rings, I'm not sure if I mentioned this in voiceover yet or not, but more or less when a piston or a ring rather heats up under high power application, the ends will actually kind of get close to, to each other and they can even butt together and kind of season the bore. And when that happens and the piston's being pushed down by the flame front, um, that locked up ring can actually cause the upper ring line just to kind of break off. And that'll kind of ruin your day and ruin your motor. So we increase the ring gap on a forced induction engine just to prevent that from happening. Um, now the drawback to say going with a too large ring gap because like 30 thousandths of an inch is not necessarily too large, but it's larger than it needs to be. You, in theory, could have a little bit more blow by and a little bit more crankcase pressure. But, you know, we're talking in this case probably four thousandths of an inch more than it ought to be. I think it'll be okay. I know a lot of guys run really big ring gaps and stuff like that. But if you're going to do this and if you have a good virgin motor that the ring gaps are a little bit tighter on, just try to shoot for you know, what your specification calls for because there's a calculation you can do based on the bore size of the engine and the usage, whether that's naturally aspirated or forced induction. Um, and it'll tell you exactly what your ring gap should be. So anyway, we're just about ready to start putting this thing back together. Um, I mentioned we're going to be reusing the stock bearings. These look really, really good. They're in great shape, so no reason not to. We're using the stock hardware because we would have to resize all of these at a machine shop if I put ARP bolts in here. Um, and that's pretty much it. I think, oh, I put the back cover on just because it's kind of hard to get to. So when I had the engine hanging and I was cleaning it, I put the back cover on. That way I can put the oil pan on on the stand here. And probably what I'll finish up with today is I'll just get a couple of pistons in the hole. I'll double check the ring gap on them and we'll see how far we get. So once you have the gaps of the rings set exactly where you want them, the next step is obviously loading the rings up onto the piston. You start at the bottom with the oil separator, oil scraper, whatever you call the little squiggly ring. Then you've got a little oil rail that goes on top and on the bottom of the separator. And then you want to put the second ring on and just make sure that you stagger the ring gaps so that way they're not all just stacked up in a row. That would allow combustion gases to basically go straight down into the crankcase. Once I'm happy with the way that the gaps are set and the clocking of the rings, I'll take just a little bit of 30 weight motor oil and just kind of put them around the rings and around the skirt of the piston. That way the spring compressor, or the ring compressor rather, will just kind of allow the piston to slip easily down in the bore. Yeah. 
Don't forget the assembly lube. That's really important on the bearings because you won't have oil pressure when you start up a brand new motor for a second or two. Um, also, assembly lube on both halves. And then I'm going to be dropping the piston and rod assembly down into the block and just using a rubber hammer just to kind of gently tap it in. You shouldn't require, it shouldn't take a lot of force to do this, just kind of gentle taps and it should seat down in. And another important thing not to forget is put a little bit of lubricant on the threads of the bolts. That way, when you go to torque them down, you'll get a nice even torque. Now, I'm sure that just about everybody on the planet has read the article that Hot Rod Magazine did some years ago about a stock junkyard LS where they gapped the rings and they turned up the boost and they made like 12 or 1300 horsepower and it lasted for 50 or 60 dyno pulls or something ridiculous like that. Well, that's basically what we have here because at the end of the article they stated they didn't realize that it was a 4.8, which I don't know how you could take an engine apart and gap the rings and not realize that it was a 4.8 instead of a 5.3. But regardless, this is the exact combination that they used on the bottom end at least. I know they put a different cam and cylinder heads and things on it like that. But um, this is what we have. Uh, I figured I'd mention real quick honing the cylinders. I don't think I mentioned that yet. I actually haven't, and that's because I am reusing the stock rings and the rings are in the stock position. So there's really no need to hone this thing out. Now, if the engine smoked a bunch or had a ton of blow by, uh, it might be worth your while to get some new rings and hone out the cylinders just a little bit to kind of clean up the cross hatch. But remember, everything's going back together exactly how it came out. We had no smoke or blow by, and there's still a nice cross hatch finish on the cylinder wall. So we're just putting it back together. Uh, in terms of materials that you'll need to use uh, to do this job rather, uh, oh, which backtracking a little bit, the ring gaps on this side of the engine, cylinders two, four, six, and eight, these is kind of odd. It started at the front at like 28, and then by the time I got to the back one, it was like 26 and a half to 27 thousandths ring gap on this side, where the first two over here were like, I think they were like 29 and a half, I called it 30. But anyway, I went through the effort just to open them up to a, I'll be exactly the same, a 30 thousandths of an inch. I don't have a fancy ring grinder, but I do have a metal table and some sticky back sandpaper. This is 180 grit, and you can kind of see the little dust on there. All I did was take the ring and just kind of back and forth. And that's what I used to uh, check the gaps. It's real easy to do um, by doing it by hand like this. You can't really go too far because it's it takes a, a fair amount of effort to open up the gap. So if you use a, a grinder or something like that, I would be worried you could go way too far, way too quick. But anyway, um, yeah, so all the gaps now are at exactly 30 thousandths of an inch. Make sure you chamfer the ends of the ring so they don't scratch the bore or anything like that. Um, in terms of materials, let me go over real quick. Uh, these are the three different lubricants I'm using to put this together. Assembly lube, apparently, right now is really hard to find. I went to uh, three different stores to find this. The O'Reilly's I went to, they said that every single O'Reilly store in my area was out of assembly lube, not just that one kind. Uh, their distribution center, their warehouse, whatever, all were sold out of assembly lube. But I went to an AutoZone and they didn't have any, but they were able to look up another AutoZone store in my area. And that's where I eventually found the assembly lube. And they only had two bottles, so I bought both of them. Um, for the rod bolts, I'm just using ARP Ultra Torque. I put a little bit on the threads as well as underneath the head that'll make torquing go a little bit smoother. And in that bottle right there, I just have some 30 weight engine oil and I use that to coat the rings on the pistons and wipe down the cylinder walls before I put the thing together. And that's kind of the lube that we used here. So yeah, we have a short block here that according to Hot Rod is capable of a thousand horsepower. Once again, I don't know how long it would last at that power level, and I don't think I'm necessarily going to try to reach a thousand horsepower from this engine. My final goal for the truck, well, never say final goal, but my intermediate goal for the truck is probably like 650 horsepower, somewhere in there. I think we can easily make that regardless of which power adder I choose because it's still up in the air. I'm thinking turbo, but maybe supercharger. I'd like to do a centrifugal. I, I, I don't know. I want one of each is really what I want. I want one truck with a turbo, one truck with a roots blower, and one truck with a centrifugal. So I don't know which one this will end up as, but either way, we have a bottom end that is probably fairly strong. Um, lots of factors go into how long it will last, like the tune-up, you know, what fuel you use, uh, how heavy the vehicle is. There's a lot of different factors that go into how much stress an engine will see. But anyway, um, that's going to bring this video to an end. In the next video, we're going to stab the camshaft in, 
Uh, I'll show you to green the can because that's pretty important to do. Uh, we'll put the heads back on, valve springs. I've still got to order a few more parts and we didn't get a chance today to talk about the budget, but uh, I've already spent well over $3,000, which is kind of my first benchmark that I wanted to compare against. I'll get to that in the next video, but I do want to say thank you guys for watching. I appreciate it. Uh, do me the three favors, like, comment, and subscribe. That all helps the channel grow. Um, you guys are the best. Thank you for watching. We'll catch you next time.